Let's talk about the quantum mechanics of two-dimensional rotational motion. In this situation, we're talking about a particle moving around a ring where the position of a particle is defined as the angle uh, with respect to the x-axis, phi, and the distance the particle is from the center of the ring is defined as r. The equations on the left show the expressions for rotational energy, moment of inertia, and angular momentum. In these equations, omega represents the angular frequency in radians per second, and as mentioned earlier, I is the moment of inertia. Now, the quantum mechanics of this motion requires that we write the Hamiltonian operator for motion in two dimensions. We'll assume that the potential energy is equal to zero, so the only term we need to be concerned about is that for kinetic energy. Since we're talking about two dimensions, we need the second derivative with respect to x and with respect to y. So we have expressions for kinetic energy in two-dimensional motion. The mathematics is easier if we do the transformation for Cartesian coordinates x and y to radial coordinates r and phi. In this case, r is a constant because that distance from the center of motion is not varying in our system. The only variable is, uh, the, is phi, the, angular, uh, the angle with respect to the x-axis in that motion. When we do that transformation, the Hamiltonian becomes much simpler. Uh, rather than having two second derivatives, we only have one second derivative to deal with. Um, and if we're talking about two particle systems, such as that for a diatomic molecule, there's a simple um, transformation that changes the mass m for a single particle into mu, the reduced mass for two particles, uh, which we talked about earlier. We'll also note in this equation that r for a diatomic molecule represents the actual bond length of that molecule. Um, and that can be simplified to the moment of inertia, uh, where the moment of inertia for a diatomic molecule is simply defined as mu, the reduced mass, times the bond length squared. Now we have the Schrodinger equation for two-dimensional rotational motion. Um, and we can solve this equation actually very quickly if we note the similarity between this equation and that for the one-dimensional particle in the box. Uh, the only difference between these two equations is that instead of x, as in one-dimensional particle in the box, we have variable phi, and instead of m for mass for the 1D box, we have the moment of inertia. Uh, so mathematically, there is no difference between the two equations. We've just changed the names to protect the innocent. The solutions, therefore, will be very similar. For the one-dimensional particle in the box, the wave function was equal to AE to the plus or minus IKX, where K was a collection of constants that were in the original equation. That means that we'll have a similar solution for the two-dimensional rotational motion. We'll replace the K with M, which represents a collection of constants, which involves the moment of inertia. If you compare these two, um, you'll simply see that the only difference between these is we have replaced the mass with the moment of inertia in the case of two-dimensional rotation. Now we simply go ahead and apply boundary conditions, um, which in this case will be different than that for the one-dimensional particle box because we're talking about motion in the ring. The requirement that the wave function be single-valued means that when the particle has made one complete revolution of the ring, the wave function must return to the same value. Hence, the wave function value at some arbitrary angle phi must be equal to that value of phi plus 2 pi because it corresponds to the same point. Substituting the expression for the wave function with the variables phi and phi plus 2 pi, we have this condition that the two must be equal. Now, properties of exponents very simply allow us to make uh, separate the exponent into two components as we see here um, and of course we'll note that the IE to the IM phi cancels out and we're left with the expression that E to the IM 2 pi must be equal to 1. Now 
if we use the Euler relation, we can make the substitution e i m two to the two pi. Um, is equal to the cosine of m2 pi plus the i sine of m2 pi and this will be equal to 1 only when the first term is equal to 1 and the second imaginary term is equal to 0. This will happen when m in that cosine argument is equal to an integer. When m is equal to zero integer the cosine of an integer times 2 pi will always be equal to 1 and i sine of 2 pi, m 2 pi, will always be equal to zero. So that gives us a satisfactory condition. As long as m is an integer, we will have satisfied the boundary conditions for two-dimensional rotational motion. Now, if we go back to the original definition of m from the solution to the Schrodinger equation, it was this collection of constants. If we rearrange this equation solving for e, we get that e is equal to m squared h bar squared is 2i as shown here. Now, because m is an integer, that means that once again we have quantized energy levels. There are only discrete energies allowed for the system. So we'll have an energy level structure with the lowest energy corresponding to m equal to zero. When that m is equal to zero, then of course the energy is equal to zero. And if for m plus or minus 1, because the energy depends on m squared, we'll notice that m plus or minus 1 uh, both had the same energy, m plus or minus 2 had the same energy, m plus or minus 3, etc. will have the same energy. So what we have here is a case of double degeneracy for all levels above the m equals 0 level. Now, if we look at angular momentum, we'll find that it is quantized just as energy is quantized because angular momentum corresponds to a situation where L is equal to I omega. We can also see that for rotational energy, the energy is L squared over 2I uh, because we'll note that energy is also equal to M squared H bar squared over 2I. That means that L is equal to M H bar. Now, because m, of course, is an integer, that means L is also quantized because the L values for angular momentum can only be 0, plus or minus h bar, plus or minus 2h bar, etc. Now, because angular momentum is observable, it must have an operator, and indeed it does. The operator for L is h bar over i d by d phi, and of course, I've added the subscript z here because by our definition the angular momentum uh, vector is directed along the z-axis for this two-dimensional rotational motion in the xy plane. If we operate on our wave function with the angular momentum operator, uh, we get mh bar times the original and because we get mh bar times the original wave function, the eigenvalues mh bar as noted before, which is consistent with our original specification that L be equal to mh bar. This is the eigen, uh, the energy, or excuse me, the angular momentum eigenvalue. This, of course, then is what we will measure in the laboratory. Of course, we've yet to normalize our wave function, so we'll use a simple normalization expression to determine that. Um, in this case, because our function is imaginary, we need to take careful uh, note here that we do have to use the complex conjugate of our original wave function, as you will see here. Uh, now, if we go ahead and carry through this expression, it's easy to see the multiplication of the two exponential terms gives us e to the 0, which is equal to 1. Um, so that simplifies our expression a great deal. Um, this is a very simple integral to evaluate. We go through this evaluation, of course, the integration gives us a star a, a star b in the complex conjugate of our normalization constant, um, and just simply solving for a, we get the square root of 1 over 2 pi. So our overall wave function, then, is going to be psi is equal to the square root of 1 over 2 pi times e to the i m phi. 
There are some simple applications of the quantum mechanical model for two-dimensional rotational motion, and one of those is FEMO, the free electron molecular orbital method, similar to what we applied to conjugated chains um, in uh, organic molecules. In this case, we're actually talking about a situation where we might use this to talk about uh, the pi electron structure in rings, like benzene, for example. Um, and in this case, basically what we do is we figure out how many pi electrons we have in that ring circulating. And we apply the simple energy level structure we discussed earlier for two-dimensional motion uh, to determine the HOMO for those electrons and the LUMO to determine, determine of course, the lowest energy transition in those molecules. This will end our discussion of two-dimensional rotational motion. In the next video, we will pick up talking about three-dimensional motion.